Hi, everybody. I think we're ready to get started. All ready, Reed? Hi, everybody. I am uh, Jason Bowley. Thanks for joining us today. I'm the Senior Vice President of Systems and Operations here at uh, BWF. I'm glad you could join us. We're going to spend a little bit of time today talking about business intelligence. Um, and um, I'm not going to do much by way of introduction. I have a little bit of additional information later on in the, in the slideshow. We want to kind of jump right into it. Uh, so I'm going to throw it over to Reed Tyler directly, let him introduce himself. Very excited to have uh, Reed on board as a director of business intelligence, and he's been doing some great work with clients on uh, reporting strategy and dashboards that uh, uh, it's just a great opportunity to share that with uh, you today, and uh, we hope you enjoy uh, the content. Reed? Thanks, Jason. As he said, I'm the director of business intelligence here at BWF, and I'm Really looking forward to showing you some of the things that we've been doing. Um, but first off, I want to talk about what business intelligence is and what it isn't and how to think about it. So the way I think about it is, think of it as a language between data and the humans, right? So business intelligence <clears throat> can be shown in numbers. It could be shown in compelling visuals, uh, et cetera. But really what we're trying to tackle is how to make that language really efficient. So we're moving away from static printed reports. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this to where you know, it's hard to find data quickly. It's hard to find anomalies quickly. Moving away from Excel, um, still using Excel for analysis work and it's a great tool. I use it all the time. But pivot tables and using Excel and sharing it is not really a scalable option. Getting into something a little more compelling, um, but this really isn't interactive. This isn't really showing you the whole picture. Um, you can't ask it questions. So if you look in the, in the lower right-hand uh, box, we can see that we're trending up in this chart, but I can see some spikes that I'm gonna have to call somebody to ask questions about. We wanna avoid that and really create a full service, self-service operation for the individual individual users, something that they can engage in, engage with, see anomalies really, really quickly, and then ask this questions by selecting or changing the filters, et cetera. So today we're gonna to talk about briefly what business intelligence is going to accomplish. Uh, we wanna talk about where we are now as a collective get some polling done so you can see what your peers are doing. Uh, we'll get into a brief history. Jason is gonna talk about how we're actually gonna connect with our data and talk about various refresh methods. And then we're gonna get up and running with business intelligence. I'll do a quick demo of uh, getting a dashboard and Power BI up from scratch. And then we'll talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Reed, and we're gonna do that all in about, we're gonna try to do that all in about 30 minutes. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned in the chat, I'll try to monitor for Q&As as they come in, but I think we're going to try to hold most of the questions till the end of the content, um, and then we'll, we'll, um, I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, pick a few from that, um, and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have today. So as we can see here, if any of you are Farside fans, I know I am, this is what we're trying to avoid, obviously, with the printed reports. You know, sometimes you know that on page 15, line 30, you know exactly where to find that because you wrote it down. We want to avoid that. We really want to be able to quickly identify these anomalies and not have this scenario. So ultimately, we're saving time. And this is really twofold. We're, we're saving time on the leadership side as they don't have to pick up the phone and call somebody. They, they have a self-service option that they can browse and engage with. But also on the reporting staff side, we want to make sure that we're not recreating the wheel every month and exporting data and uh, printing reports, you know, compiling and aggregating. So as I, as I mentioned, we wanna quickly identify these anomalies and opportunities, but then also be able to effectively communicate the insights. So where are we now as a collective? I figured this would be helpful for all of us to see what we're using. So we are gonna introduce some polling. How are you viewing your data now? And you can select multiple of these. We'll get this started.
So how is everybody using their, or viewing their data? Printed reports, PDFs, Excel, Tableau. I'll give you just a little bit to fill this out. So this is what we're seeing, and this is exactly what we expected. You know, a lot of people are still using Excel, which is a very powerful tool, um, but we want to be able to really move past that and get to a more automated solution. So our second question, how is your vice president, executive CEO, board, how are they seeing it? Exactly what we expect. A lot of, a lot of our leadership are still requesting that printed workbook or printed reports. Part of this is we want to engage with them too. We want them to have access to a very quick and efficient method of gaining insights. So thank you all for participating. Share these results with you. Great. So brief history, and the point here is that business intelligence is not a new concept. So you can see in 1865, the, the term was coined, and it's really a way to gather information and use it as a competitive advantage. More recently, IBM coined the term as using technology to do this. And so most recently, business intelligence, as it's understood, uses technology to gather and analyze data translate it into useful, useful information, and then act on that. Essentially, the modern ver version of BI focuses on technology, a way to make decisions quickly and efficiently based on the right information at the right time. This um, is another example to show that same point that business intelligence, as you can see, is not a new idea. So this is Google search trends over time. And we can see that business intelligence is Googled about the same throughout time. In 2015, Microsoft Power BI launched their product and we can see it gaining a little, gaining a little bit of attention. But then what's interesting to me is in 2020, we can see that business intelligence was Googled more than Tableau or BI. And what that's telling me is that it's growing as an industry and it's also growing as a, uh, the, the vendors that are entering the market. There are hundreds of them now. I wanted to talk about my journey with BI and in hopes that it's gonna resonate with some of you. Maybe you can relate to some of the things that you do now, or maybe something you did in the past, and then how, how I move forward. So in 2012, I was working in uh, healthcare in the revenue cycle management division, and I was a financial analyst. And, I found myself combing through these stacks of reports. This is something when I got into it, it had been done. Um, this is their process. So I had to embrace it for the time being. And this took me about 30 hours per month. And I was aggregating manually all this data and piling reports and putting them into a readable format for board members and executives. I quickly moved away from that. I wrote some software that, that automated, sorry, automated that manual aggregation, uh, put it in a format, um, transformed it into a way that Excel could easily read it. I could explore with pivot tables. And this took me down from 30 hours per month to about 12 hours. It's a good start. Um, so our primary software that we were using, that we were getting the data from, they announced that they were partnering with Tableau Online in 2014, so we could have one data source for the majority of our data. This was great because I could spend a bunch of time upfront developing these reports and then just have them automatically refresh. This took me down to about six hours as I was still using other data from our finance software, accounting um, and compiling reports. So finally, when Microsoft Power BI was released, we jumped on that. It was, a, it was a relatively inexpensive way to get into um, compiling a lot of data, aggregating it, have it be automated. 
And now I'm spending about 15 minutes per month just fine tuning, making the visuals more compelling and more effective. So in 2018, I joined the fundraising space and I found myself in the same scenario that I did in 2012, where it was, it was a really manual process to get reporting and insights out to people. And so knowing from my experience um, that I could quickly implement something like Power BI, I did exactly that. We were using Razor's Edge NXT at the time, which um, has capability to connect to their API, which we can pull out that data, automatically refresh it, and now we have it in a source in Power BI that's much more sophisticated and easier to communicate insights. So Jason is now going to talk a little bit about how we're actually going to connect to our data. Sure, thanks, Reed. Um, and I'll just before we get started there, I'll just echo um, what Reed, uh, Reed said on the previous slide. Uh, in my journey in BI is similar. I used to work in uh, healthcare prior to going uh, working at BWF, and I was able to uh, take our um, about eight to ten hour uh, Excel based dashboard process down to about fifteen minutes. Once being able to to uh, to uh, do that in Tableau, so uh, on our end, and so that was a very uh, similar and uh, time saving journey. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of pieces to that, but um, but the end can be quite rewarding. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, different options for uh, getting access to data for a reporting project, and this is really. Um, um, one of the topics that we work carefully with on clients because uh, it, it does take a significant amount of time to establish the baseline for how you're going to access data in your institution. There's a lot of different options um, and it, it can be, um, there's just a lot of different variables that kind of have to be worked out. The good news is, is kind of once you do it and you get that baseline set up, then it opens up a whole world of reporting possibilities. So, you know, on any given project like this, you know, 75 to 80 percent of the time can be uh, uh, access and figuring out how to access the data and uh, standardizing the data for reporting. So if we start out here, um, the first option I'll talk about is kind of starting on the large end. Uh, if you're at a, a large institution with um, significant resources, uh, you may find that you have uh, uh, enterprise data warehouse capabilities, which is a great, a great scenario to be in. Um, and uh, an enterprise data warehouse is basically a separate data layer outside of um, a CRM or a fundraising data database that is uh, combining information from around the institution. So there may be your fundraising data in there. There may be, or I should say, uh, a subset of your fundraising data. Um, it may be some enrollment information, some finance information, and you're trying to get that holistic view of a constituent across the organization. An enterprise data warehouse is, um, uh, is, is a significant undertaking. So at this point, it's usually uh, larger, more sophisticated organizations that, um, that have access to, to that kind of resource. Um, but it is growing in popularity and it's also growing in vendor resources in terms of uh, resources for helping create those enterprise data warehouse layers um, because that uh, that the holistic constituent view is really the ultimate goal for a lot of organizations so we can uh, both uh, solicit and steward uh, our constituents appropriately. If you want to go to the next slide there, we'll talk about a little pros and cons of each of those. So pros of a data warehouse, uh, of course, accessing multiple data sources, probably close to real time or an overnight snapshot view. Um, there's an opportunity when you're talking data warehouse to standardize view. So it's not just the raw data out of the database, but um, you can combine data points and create a really nice uh, standardized data layer. Um, it can be automated um, and it improves performance if you have a large number of records. The cons are that it's expensive and, it, you know, like I said, it's typically at large institutions that have um, or, uh, staff with specific skill sets to maintain that um, and, and also technology. So we're going to kind of work down the ladder here. Um, uh, outside of enterprise data warehouse, uh, we could look at a third party data layer. Um, and so what I mean by that is some databases, um, if they 
uh, have challenges in terms of direct access to the database. So we may look at a third party uh, tool or vendor to help us extract information out of the primary uh, fundraising database or CRM and store that in a cloud layer or uh, an on-premise layer to facilitate our reporting. So similar to a data warehouse, but where we would probably be talking about a singular source of data um, primarily the fundraising CRM, most likely. Uh, I will mention that um, in our work, we have a, a very good partner um, uh, that is a Blackbot ISV called a Mission BI that we work a lot with um, because uh, access to that uh, um, uh, for clients that are on Razor's Edge, um, that's proven to be a very popular uh, resource to um, create that extracted and uh, normalized data layer in the cloud, which we can then use, leverage our tools to do reporting on. Um, and, and that's a, uh, been a very good partnership for us. So some of the pros and cons to that can be close to real-time uh, access. Uh, again, if you're on Razor's Edge, it's utilizing the API for, for Razor's Edge or can access the API. You can get real-time or again, snapshot data. Uh, you have a chance to standardize that data again and it can be automated. Um, but those tools can be expensive. They're, um, not every uh, institution has the resources to do that. Um, and again, we're not typically talking, pulling in multiple uh, databases from across the institution. Um, it may be limited to just the primary CRM access. <laughs> Um, again, moving down the ladder, um, a very good option is if we can have direct access to the database tables, um, either direct access or via an API. Um, um, I'm back, my background's in SQL, so I'm used to uh, being able to tap into resources from that perspective. Um, but if you're on a tool like um, Tableau or Power BI, um, they have a lot of built-in in integration to data repositories and, and different CRMs like Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics. So um, where it's possible, um, you can set up a reporting tool to tie directly into that database environment. And uh, when you do so, some of the pros and cons of that would be that you really have real-time access or close to real-time access to the, to the data. Um, and again, it's, it would, it's usually like a full, fully automated scenario. Um, the pro part of the limitations of, of that is that it's not standard among CRM vendor, all CRM vendors, I should say. Um, uh, so it's kind of a, there's some gaps there in terms of being able to utilize that. You can't just expect to buy a tool and tap right into your database. It really depends on what you're using and the capabilities there. There's also, of course, security uh, concerns there if you're talking about access, direct access to data. So not every institution is gonna have that ability, even if you have the technology to do so. Um, and there can be performance issues if you have large uh, record counts um, and you're looking at um, uh, a, a, a API utilization. Some of them have record call limitations um, and some of them do not have all fields access, accessible via the API. So you might not be able to get every piece of data in the database. So uh, even though it's direct access um, or through the API, you may still uh, encounter some limitations from the reporting perspective. Next, we'll call it automated or semi-automated raw data extract. So it's exactly what it sounds like in terms of raw data. It, 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 most of you will have reporting staff that can run queries or exports from your database. Uh, may come out in an Excel or a CSV format. We're taking one or multiple data sets and we are putting them probably on the network drive or some secure repository. And then we tap into those from the reporting tool. Uh, the difference between this and the next slide will be that uh, in this scenario, we're able to um, automate those extracts. Um, some CRM tools have built-in capabilities to do that like a queue process or a scheduler. Um, some do not. Um, if you can automate that, um, uh, both the, this option and the next one is, um, they're both inexpensive. Uh, this particular one can be automated, uh, but the cons are it may require staff intervention and those extracts could take a long time to run if you're wanting to report on all constituents or all gift counts, uh, for instance. And then finally, we just have the manual raw data extracts where it's literally like somebody in the database hitting the button, data comes out. Uh, same scenario as before, but it's going to be a manual process. We don't have the capabilities to automate that, um, but there's still value there. And to be honest, if we um, go to the next slide, the pros and cons, um, it's inexpensive um, and it doesn't require IT expert. 
uh, expertise. So imagine just we're running a report out of your database, a CSV file, and that's what you do reporting off of. That's how a lot of people, including me, I've been working in Tableau for, you know, 15 plus years. And that's how I got started is, um, you know, I took what data I could for the uh, position that I had, um, the role I had in the institution, um, and I produced the data that way, and that's what I use for reporting, and then kind of grew it from there. Uh, the cons are that it's a, a manual, not real-time or non-automated process. Reed? Great. Thanks, Jason. So let's get into some actual uh, demos and let's look into building a dashboard from scratch. This is going to be fairly high level. Um, I want to talk about being able to get this up and running for those that are interested in doing it very quickly with that last option that uh, Jason just talked about. So we're manually extracting data into an Excel file and then we're going to connect that to Power BI. So here I have an instance of Power BI desktop running. We're going to get into an Excel file. Let's see what this looks like. So I've got two tabs. We've got GIFs and constituents. Very simple data. We'll load that into our Power BI tool. It recognizes that we have two different tables. We will load both of those in. Great, now we can see our multiple tables here on the right with our fields underneath. And the first thing we wanna do is create a relationship between these two tables. That way we can properly segment and, and move around and be able to analyze. So to do that, we need to have a common ID between the two tables. Here we have the constituent ID. So we'll go ahead and click and drag and make that connection. Power BI recognizes that. And there we have it. All right, so we're gonna look at seasonality today. So we're gonna build a simple line chart and we obviously need the date and the amount. So starting off, this, this looks at year over year. Um, Power BI nicely puts this into a date hierarchy where we can see year, quarter, month, day, and then drill down into that. So for this purpose, let's look at month over month. So this is a great view. We can add a quick trend line to this and get some quick insights here. Now, if we're looking at seasonality, we're gonna to wanna to look at month by month over year. So let's look at that. So we'll get rid of year, we'll get rid of quarter, we'll get rid of day. So now we can see that our data is being aggregated by each individual month. Let's drag the year into the legend so we can see each of our years separately. That's a fairly good look. Now we can see some seasonality happening, uh, common between years. But the problem with this is, is it's not very focused. This doesn't really capture the eye. It doesn't really put what we're trying to measure in the forefront. And so let's do some conditional formatting to really uh, bring the current year into, um, into view and then hide the other ones. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, I think we just wanna look at maybe the last three years. That helps it clean up a little bit. Let's take that a little bit further. So we're gonna customize each series. And then we're going to emphasize our current year. This is a little bit better. Let's take that a step further and look at our data colors. And we just want these to be light, still visible, but we just want these for context. We want these for reference. Because what we're measuring is our current year. To be able to segment this, let's take our related table and we'll make this a filter, make this a little bit easier to see for the end user. increase the text size. And now we have a filter that we can filter through our data 
and be able to see what these different trends are per segment. So I realize this is a simple introduction into Power BI. There's a lot of capabilities here. And as you can imagine, and I hope you're thinking about that, um, you know, what different segments you can look at and um, how to represent that data. So we've been, <clears throat> we've been developing some of these for clients and I wanted to show you a little bit of what we're doing. So this is an annual performance view. We can see some KPIs. We can see the rate of change of each of those KPIs. And the point is we want to be able to tell a story very quickly. We can see the retention rate by gift constituency. And then we can see quickly identify which of those constituencies are, are more important to focus on um, by the level of uh, color. We can also see gifts over time. And then we can see really, really quickly just by hovering over get a little more detail into that. And so we have our top supporters for this year. So as we look at this from a leadership perspective, we, we're, we need to figure out why we're in a decline here. So if we look, our annual fund is doing great. We've invested a lot of resources into that and we can see the results. Our mid-level program is also performing fairly well. We've invested a lot of resources there. But here we can see that perhaps it's our major giving program that we need to focus on. Again, I can highlight over this and we can see large gifts. Uh, Mr. Mullins, 2.7 million in 1819. And that didn't happen this year. So moving through, we wanna take the same idea and then put it in different views to get different ideas. So this is the same exact data over time, but now we can see some seasonality. We can quickly hover over some of these numbers that stick out to us or stand out to us and quickly identify why these anomalies might exist. It's fully dynamic. We can segment by giving level or we can look at individual campaigns, our annual fund, or we can see our capital campaign, when that ended, we can see our endowment campaign, et cetera. Finally, we have more of a, uh, a account by constituency. So we have year to, do, year, year to date donor count by fiscal year, retained count, new donors, and then also the amounts. We have an average gift amount. Again, we see an anomaly. We can hover over that, identify that Mr. Mullen's gift of 2.7, and then be able to see our, our giving segments and their retention rate and where they are right now. And again, we wanna make this fully dynamic so we can fully, so we can dig in quickly and get our, uh, and gather our insights quickly. So while these numbers are important and having a lot of numbers, a new take on building dashboards is really to make it more interactive. And this is something we looked at a little bit earlier, um, but this is a, a view that we can quickly see uh, and identify um, a lot of different anomalies going on. So this, imagine all of your assigned prospects here, right? We can see each stage that those prospects are in. We can see how many days that they've been in each stage. We can see portfolio size and a breakdown by our major gift officers. And then quickly be able to highlight some of these and know who to talk to. So for example, if I highlight some of these that are that have been in the solicitation stage for a long time, I can see that Alex here has six of these. Well, that makes me wanna look at Alex's portfolio. And I can see that that's kind of a normal trend. So this is a good conversation starter to have with Alex. And the point is we don't wanna to drill too much into the numbers. We really want insights that will get us to take action, right? and have these conversations and move performance. Again, we can look at different regions or on an individual state by state basis. So let's talk a little bit about best practices. Um, first and foremost, have, have an effective data governance strategy Business intelligence just cannot work without good 
clean, accurate data. You need secure data. Uh, second point is think big, but start small. And what I mean by this is think big about relevant information across your enterprise that can be important to improve your performance. For example, if you think that um, gaining finance and accounting information so you can calculate ROI is important, that's one of the relevant data points that you want to look at getting. This doesn't mean that you have to start there, though. It's important to start small and look at really impactful dashboards that will really get you moving. Um, define a, a roadmap. Uh, make sure you're sticking to um, designing your dashboards that align with business strategy. Limit the data to only what you need. We don't need all of the data in the world. We actually want very uh, clear and concise data points um, that's really going to improve performance. We, are, we don't want to be the analyst. That's, that's what analytics is for. Uh, when we're building these, as we mentioned earlier, we don't want the dashboards to look cluttered. Um, Scott Bernardo of Harvard Business Review has a very good book talking about this, and he's coined the phrase, isolate and then emphasize. And this clearly gets your point to the forefront of the dashboard so it doesn't look cluttered and you can uh, efficiently tell a story. Make sure you get leadership and community buy-in. What I mean by this is consider a uh, committee that's going to be involved in the design and implementation stage of your um, BI reporting. And the point of this is we want people to actually use the product. As we saw earlier in the polls, our leadership team is still requesting those PDFs. So if we get them involved in how, how to design these reports and gain their perspective, there's gonna be less intimidation to actually use the product. They're also gonna champion the product once you actually implement into your organization and get new user buy-in quickly. Then finally, we just need to make sure we validate. It's so important to have the right calculations and making sure that they're portraying the right information. Jason? Thanks, Reed. Yeah, we've just got a couple of cl closing slides here, and there's been some good questions, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about those in just a minute. Uh, but I did want to give some background on our firm just in, in closing. Um, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with BWF, uh, we've been around for 40 years, um, and we do, uh, we, we are a full service consulting firm, um, meaning that we uh, do both the fundraising strategy, like campaign assessments, annual giving strategy, but we also uh, mentioned I'm on the, our, our teams, the systems and operations team. So we uh, operate in the technical space as well, which uh, these reports in our analytics division uh, falls into, and those two are very closely related. Um, but what our goal in, um, in, in working with clients on these types of projects is to, it, 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 there's a variety of ways that we can approach it. Um, we do have pre-built dashboards um, and are continuing to develop those where um, those are built on best practices where we could work with a client to deploy those in the organization. And let's say we're like 80% there and it's like you have to do the extra 20% of customization with a client to get those deployed or customized to the individual organization's unique needs. But we also are, are flexible and um, we'll just work with clients. Uh, you may have Tableau or Microsoft BI in your institution, but uh, may have uh, some resource constraints or just not the expertise to know how to deploy or utilize that. And we work with clients uh, on that as well, or just um, institutions that are trying to find a strategy for how they can um, uh, take this from the ground level to the next level in their organization. So some assessment work uh, from that perspective. Uh, so training um, and, uh, and we want to be able to uh, be, uh, you know, work with clients. We do host reports in, uh, on, on our, our servers. We, we utilize Tableau um, for that, for that uh, purpose. Um, but we also work with clients just to um, uh, deploy dashboards um, that are created in their internal environment, depending on what that situation looks like. So there's a whole variety of options there when you're, when you're talking through uh, these uh, that, that can 
it's a, every individual institution is unique and um, uh, we, we use a, um, a kind of a decision tree of uh, when we're talking with clients about the different decision points that need to be made and what uh, that leads to the best decision or the best strategy for working with that individual organization. Um, so uh, after we close here, um, for those of you that don't hang around for the Q&A, if you want to talk more about this, um, we'd be happy to, um, um, you know, schedule some, some time and, and, and just talk through your unique scenarios. Happy to do that, do that quite often with, uh, with folks. Um, and our contact information is on the next slide. But before we get there, I just wanted to mention um, some platforms and partnerships that we work with. Um, and... Um, uh, we mentioned Mission BI earlier. It's an ISV on the Razor's Edge platform. We have a you know very very common uh, Razor's Edge Razor's Edge NXT, a very common platform. And so um, uh, we we work with a lot of clients on that. Mission BI has been a very good partner on that. I'm not a chance to talk about RealZip. So, but if you're on Salesforce and your RealZip isn't really a reporting platform, it's more of a um, data augmentation in terms of being able to supplement data. So that's kind of a next phase of reporting where it's not only just like getting the data you have out, but let's add additional data in. So you think geocoding um, or market uh, data. Uh, that's what RealZips uh, um, does, and we uh, are, are partners with the, good partners with them. And uh, that's a uh, specific to Salesforce, but I did want to uh, mention them as well. So if you're on that platform, uh, you might Google them to find out more. And we're happy to talk to you about that. And then of course Tableau and BI. And uh, one icon I was remiss to put up here was our Salesforce.org partnership, um, but we are certified Salesforce.org partners as well. So um, we work with a lot of institutions that are on that um, and a very popular platform. So uh, that uh, is going to wrap up. That takes us to about 30 minutes where we want to be a little bit over. Um, and we're gonna wrap up with some questions. Uh, that Again, that is our uh, 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 contact information. Feel free to reach out via LinkedIn. Always happy to connect with people. Uh, drop myself or read a line. We're happy to connect um, via email, a uh, short phone call to talk through um, any uh, challenges that you may have be having at your institution. Reed, I'm going to throw a couple of questions out there um, as they come Great. in. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to reassure everybody those were not real donor names. So uh, <laughs> uh, we, we were we were conscious of that. So don't don't uh, you don't have to Google any of those folks that were on the reports. But um, could you uh, the first question that came in, I'll talk about, and then if, if after that, if you could think about the sharing options, uh, a very common question as well. Um, one question came in though, is this, is this uh, available for Tessitura? So theoretically, the, the theories that are covered in this presentation can be adapted to most database platforms. Um, the specific solution might be unique to each individual organization though. So, um, when you get outside of um, some, I mean, what I mean by that is some databases are easier to report out of than others. That's just kind of the nature of the beast. So um, that goes into kind of the scoping of each individual uh, organization's needs. But yes, um, theoretically, you can tap a reporting tool like this directly into Tessitura. Um, and now, will these dashboards just like plug and play? Is it like a plug and play thing? No. Um, uh, there's there's a little bit a different data structure there, but you can once you get past that hurdle, yeah, you can you can use these uh, theories and these skills and these tools to develop in-house dashboards on your own. Um, it's just that the data structure of each in, in, individual database looks a little bit different. And, e and even these days, what's an even additional challenge is if you're on Salesforce, you know, if you're on like a, a, a traditional database like Aleutian Advance, and you go to an advanced database at one institution, the data structure looks the same as it would at another institution. Uh, in Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics, you will, you will not get any two uh, organizations where the data schema is exactly the same. So there's always some customization when you start talking about a project like this. And, and that's part of what we work through with clients and uh, uh, it adds to the fun and complexity of, of reporting projects. So, um, they're happy to talk more about that offline, but to read very good question, very common question about, um, okay, 
uh, we've got a reporting tool. Uh, we're using, you know, you can have Tableau on your desktop. You can have Power BI. Uh, maybe the executive leadership still wants stuff in PDF. How can you work with them to implement a tool like this? But also if you wanted them to have it on their desktop, like what are some strategies for how you can deploy this within the organization? Yeah, great question. A really common question. Um, so first we want to back up a little bit. We want to involve these leadership people if they have time, hopefully they have some interest in the design and implementation phase. Again, this encourages them to get involved. And so when, once we actually release the product, they're also excited to use it. So that's the first technique. Um, not all leaders and CEOs, et cetera, are amenable to that. We understand, but if you can encourage that, that, that really helps a lot. Um, the second on the more technical aspect of that, how are we sharing these reports? Well, there's, there's a couple ways. I'll talk about Tableau first. With a Tableau online server, um, license, you can share these reports and people can log in via a browser um, on any device from anywhere and be able to view these. So this is something that BWF does well, where we can host those reports and then you can just log in. And that option is, is for people that want the reports and want effective dashboards, but they don't want to be involved in the authoring of them and, and developing and getting the technical side of connecting the data. Um, Alternatively, in Microsoft Power BI, if you have the pro license, there's a lot of options that you can do. Um, similarly, you can log on to Power BI online and be able to share and view those dashboards. Um, another thing that both products will do is if you have a SharePoint internally, you can actually embed these reports into a SharePoint, which is another way that a lot of people are, are, are utilizing, which is helpful because you don't need that login, you don't need ultimate uh, that many clicks uh, to get into it. I would just add to that, um, we have clients that use, uh, and, and we're, we've been talking a lot about Power BI and Tableau because in our experience, that's, that's what the majority of our clients use in some way, shape or form. Um, I will say, having done this for many years, um, in general, you know, ta first, and we don't resell Tableau or, or Microsoft BI, so we don't have a, a, a stake in that, but uh, I'd say ta Tableau, neither one of the tools are perfect. They both have their strengths and, and, and weaknesses. Um, I started using Tableau because I think it's a great data exploration tool in addition to being like an enterprise reporting tool, which we didn't dig into too much, but it's great for just taking an ad hoc data set and just kind of fig finding new insights to it. Um, but the downside is Tableau is is very important uh, or expensive, and so um, I will say I've seen a shift in my inter in in large clients that I work with um, where they have enterprise licenses um, because Tableau is so expensive at an enterprise level. Um, the, the market has somewhat shifted to Microsoft BI. Microsoft put a lot of uh, development resources into BI in the last several years. It was kind of stagnant for a while. It's kind of really improved as a product, but more so the um, enterprise deployment licensing is a lot more, uh, um, I don't want to say inexpensive, but it's a lot more reasonable for some of these clients um, folks are finding. So, um, you know, you, you get a lot of different perspectives on that, but in general, that's, that's kind of what I've seen um, in working with our, our folks. Um, Question, wouldn't you have login issues with uh, using SharePoint? Um, wouldn't you be limiting the, by, limited by needing to be on the network to be able to connect to your SharePoint site? So specific question about accessing via SharePoint. I don't know if you have that level of detail read, but. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. You're exactly right. So that is the solution that is on an internal network. So this isn't something that you can you know, travel with. Um, so that's a really good point to bring up. I appreciate it. I'll just say too, there's been some comments. Uh, I'm not sure 
why this would be the case, but some apparently some folks have been encountering a, a, a limitation error with when they've tried to log into the webinar. So I apologize if any of your colleagues or, or friends have tried to log in and gotten that error. We're going to look into that. Uh, we have plenty of space, so I'm not sure why that would be happening, but we will be recording this and making it available. Um, and you'll, you should see some emails and, and things uh, following up to that. Uh, Karina will be helping us uh, with that after the, the webinar, but we did record the content and you can uh, um, absolutely have access to that at a later point. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, yes, we have some late, late entries there. Um, so um, I think that covers most of the questions. Again, if you would like to connect with us, um, I hope we've shown that both um, uh, it, it it's a, uh, a tool not to be intimidating, um, but a tool that also, uh, you know, uh, has great enterprise capabilities and we'd be happy to, um, you know, talk to you about how, um, we, if appropriate, we could help uh, do that internally. So, uh, Reed, thank you very much for your knowledge on this. And, uh, and again, uh, please feel free to reach out either via email or uh, connect with us on LinkedIn. I see my there's a few LinkedIn requests come through already while I'm on the presentation. So we look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Uh, and we hope to present uh, future webinars as well in the future. So thanks for joining everybody. Thanks, everybody.